Welcome to another video around this whole idea of thoughtful spending, frugal living and making your money do more than it's been doing previously so that you get the results and you get the benefits. This week I've been thinking a lot about seven ways to look at our bad money habits and how we can change them from things that are holding us back and dragging us down and moving with those seven bad money habits and converting them into little changes that will make a very big difference. Everything I'm sharing here today are things that I have gone through multiple times and over multiple years until I worked out what were obvious common mistakes around money management. Here are some signs that your finances are in the pan and out of control. One of the most obvious is when you put your bank card into the ATM machine and you're standing there holding your breath thinking, will it allow me to take out the money that I'm asking for? Another one is when your credit card bill comes in, you may get a postal statement that you open physically or you may get a notification to your email account that says your bank statement is ready or your credit card statement is ready. You open it, but you go first to what the minimum repayment is because that's easier than facing up to the whole amount on the balance for this particular month. With any behavior like this, you're trapping yourself into a financial fog. You're operating blind and you don't know what the actual details are of your money. Of course, it's difficult. Of course, it's frightening. I've been there. I know how terrifying it's been. In an effort to help you move to a better place financially, here are seven bad money habits that you can identify so that you can change them. Let's start with bad money habit number one. You're choosing to be ignorant about your numbers. The basics of getting control of your finances are really simple. You know the money that's coming in and you know the money that's going out. And this one needs to be less than the money coming in. Every time you create a surplus here, you get to do two things with it. You can spend it or you can save it. If you save it, you're building up a little bit of extra money that you don't have right now so that next month you're in a better position. If you spend that small surplus, nothing will change and the surplus disappears. If you start to save the surplus every single month, then one dollar at a time, your life can change. If you choose to stay in such a place of stressful ignorance, nothing will change in a year from now, five years from now, 20 years from now, you'll be worse off than you are today and you could have changed everything. But instead of suffering, instead of staying in such a place of stress, you can start to make a change. For the next week, use a little pocketbook or a notebook like one of these and track your expenses for that week. Then repeat the process for week two and three and four of the month so that at the end of four weeks, you have a really accurate and realistic portrayal of what your expenses are. You know what your income is. It's either static or it's two or three sources of income that are largely similar. So you know your income sources. And with the pocketbook notes that you and your significant other have taken throughout the month, you have a clear indication of what your expenses are. We'll come back to this later, but it's putting you in control. One dollar, one pound at a time. Choosing to be ignorant about your numbers is a painful place to be, but it will lead you naturally to bad money habit number two. With bad money habit number two, what you're choosing to do is protect yourself or cocoon yourself with the false sense of security that comes from using plastic all the time. If you're not letting yourself be clear about the ones and the zeros that make up your bank balance and your savings accounts, in fact, you may have no savings accounts at this stage, you're protecting yourself by using plastic wherever possible and hoping that a transaction goes through. You think, for example, you've got a couple of thousand dollars coming in every month, but you're going to be spending just under two thousand dollars every month and you'll be OK. No, you won't be OK because you'll have zero savings. You'll be bouncing up against the debt ceiling with interest being added to your accounts and you're in a worse position this month than you were last month. You're using the plastic and hoping that you'll stay within your range or your limit of financial affordability or availability of funds for when you go shopping and when you're doing your spending activity you are promising yourself that you're going to pay off the card next month when the bill comes in but you don't do that you pay the minimum or you pay 
twice the minimum, but you still are adding interest debt to your account balances and you're worse off because you have less flexibility next month because you didn't pay off the full amount this month. Attempting to protect yourself with plastic is a little bit like sitting on the edge of the swimming pool and dangling your feet in the water instead of taking the time to learn how to swim properly so you can get from one side of the pool to the other in a way that is safe and in which you are in control and you've developed a new skill. Give yourself the gift of understanding your financial situation much better by getting clear on all the numbers. Thinking you can protect yourself with a piece of plastic leads us into looking at bad money habit number three. Where you're addicted to buying things where you only pay the minimum in order to get hold of the item. With bad money habit number three, you're looking to accumulate or attract things into your life where you only have to make the minimum payment to get the thing and then you keep making a minimum payment for as long as is needed to clear the finance. You see a new cell phone, a car, an apartment, a holiday package offer, and you're excited by the beautiful way it's wrapped or packaged or promoted, and you think, oh, I've got to have that, I need this thing. But your focus is on how little you can put down each month to walk away with the item in your shopping bag or to have it as a holiday with that reservation made in your diary for next year. When you can call time on taking on more debt, and instead start to pay cash for things, you will be in such a better place. Why do you feel you have to acquire these things which you can't afford? Is there perhaps an element of you wanting to look better or to make your situation appear better to those on the outside looking in? Is there the possibility of a tiny little element of you wanting to put on a better face for what others might think of you? And this leads us quite nicely to bad money habit number four and the idea of comparison over what other people might think of us. Think of it like this. You have no idea what goes on behind another front door, whether it's somebody else's apartment or house. You have no idea. You don't really know what their finances are like. You may see a nice car on the drive. You may see good holidays. You may see a nice job. But what really happens behind that front door is of no interest to you. It's not something you have control of. Those people are not going to pay your rent or pay your household bills. So get rid of, throw away that whole sense of, oh, I've got to compare myself to the neighbours or to somebody in the same tier or a different tier of professionalism from me in the workplace. It's completely irrelevant. What matters is your finance, your household situation, and how you take control of a random situation and you bring it into order and structure so that you have the confidence and the knowledge and the understanding about your financial circumstances and how through frugality, through financial consideration, you can change things around and make things better. This is about you and your bank accounts. It's about you and your savings accounts and hopefully soon your investment activity to build yourself a strong buffer and a place of confidence as you move forward with your household finances. So forget about everybody else. Their situations are not relevant to your private, personal circumstances. And learning the truth of that will take so much weight off your shoulders and allow you to sleep better at night, to feel more confident about your purchase decisions, and to give you that peace of mind that comes from knowing what your numbers are. So focus on you and your situation and the disease, for that's what it is, the disease of comparisonitis becomes a thing of the past. And this links nicely into number five. So we're making good progress. Bad money habit number five is about you not learning as you move from one work situation or one employment situation to another because you're not improving your circumstances. Bad money habit number five is about lifestyle creep and the idea that maybe you're in a job now where you have a 10 or a 15%, maybe a 20% increase on a job that you were doing previously. And what you have to ask yourself is, if this is my salary now, and that's what my earnings were before, that 15 or 20% gap 
surely by now that's in a savings account, it's in the bank, it's in a real estate investment trust or an index fund, it's doing something, it's working for us and generating more interest income, it's generating more purchasing power when we're ready for it in the future, not necessarily right now, but that money is being put to work. Where is that money? Have you got to go on a search for it? The chances are you're not going to find the money and maybe that's why you're looking at a video like this about frugality and budgeting and household finance. You're not going to find the money because you know as well as I do that you have done what I have done in the past, which is to let lifestyle creep catch up with the new job and the new income. It's exciting, you're earning more money and you're spending the extra money. You might be going out more, you might be eating in better places, you might have upgraded your car. Your holiday is costing you more money than the holidays you would take in previous years. It's really easy to deal with bad money habit number five by thinking about what you're earning now, what you were earning in the previous job. If you go back just two or three years to the point when you were looking for your current job and thinking, oh, it would be great to have that additional money, those additional benefits, that extra flexibility of cash flow, grab your notebook, grab your pocketbook and go back through it and think, okay, where have we lifted our expenditure? What have we done to put ourselves in a better financial situation or to stay in the same financial trap? Break down the numbers, look at what the numbers are and you'll find some solutions where you can reduce the lifestyle creep you have almost subconsciously fallen into and you can build that gap between what you were earning before and what you're earning now and use that space, use that surplus to start allocating into savings, into an emergency fund, into an investment pot, into a long-term cash pot. Take a step now towards being more conscious about your money, starting to apply some frugality to think, do I need this item or do I want it? Use your money more sensibly and you will step clearly away from bad money habit number five. What you've been doing in previous months, maybe previous years, is you've been, when your wage comes in every week, you've been giving attention and focus and payment first to whoever shouts loudest. The credit card company, the mortgage company, the utility organisation, your car payments. Along with your kids and your other half, maybe you enjoy watching streaming services and movies. So if you don't pay that one, everybody will scream and shout and say, hey, I've got no access to Hulu or Amazon or Netflix. So you pay all these things first. Try a really small difference in the way you use your money on your next payday. Let the money come in, keep it in your account for 24 hours, pay a percentage of that money to a fresh account, to a new savings account, allocate some of it to an emergency fund. But you are slowing down the rate at which money flows through your fingertips and you are keeping money in an account for yourselves. In your very next payment cycle, the first payment needs to be to yourself. The next payments can be to the utility companies, the streaming service, the rent or the mortgage, the car payments, a travel card if you're using public transport to get to work or college or to be out and about and away from your house to your place of work or your place of study. Use that and buy that. But before all of those, allocate money to a savings account and to an emergency fund. If your salary is coming in on the 1st or the 15th, move your auto pay or your direct debit arrangements a few days forward so that you can first take some money allocate it to savings in an emergency fund and just use an example like 10% to begin with whilst you get used to it. Over time as you go back to the old-fashioned tactile pen and paper version of working out your weekly and your monthly expenses and income and looking for opportunities for savings and frugality things will become easier. By putting yourself first for a few days by creating a savings account and funding an emergency fund, you are building a strong, stable financial base from which you can make better decisions because you are reducing the stress each month as you build up a savings pot. So that's bad money habit number six, giving yourself an opportunity to no longer be the last payment in the series of payments you make on payday 
and instead creating financial stability and giving yourself the peace of mind to make better financial decisions in the coming months. Let's look now at the final one, bad money habit number seven. In bad money habit number seven, you are lurching from one financial surprise to another. Better said, you're lurching from one financial disaster to another because you don't know your numbers. Every year, you're gonna get a large car bill. It might be from an accident, it might be from bad weather damage, it might be from a change in insurance rates, but you have to find the money to pay those bills. A fridge or a freezer or a washing machine or an electrical repair bill in the house. Any one of these things, some years, all of them, will come along and they have the potential to push you sideways and make you wobble financially as you try to work out what on earth is going on. The fact that you know your numbers next month and the month after and the month after allows you to think, okay, every year for the last five years, I have had this bill for my car. Every couple of years, one of the white goods items in the house has failed, has needed a service, has failed to work just months after its two year guarantee period has come to an end. But you know this and yet you haven't been budgeting for it. You know this and you've chosen not to address the item by putting money aside. Maybe you've got a child or children at school and every year there is a school trip and it might be that it's a little day trip on a coach and they need to find $40 or $50 for a trip to a museum and to have food and towards the cost of transport. And they will come home from school one day saying, Mum, Dad, I need $40 for a school trip next month. $40 is a small amount of money, but when you haven't got $40, it's a painful amount of money because you can't say to your child, I, I can't find it, we don't, we, we don't have the money. You will find it, but at the moment, you'll rob Peter to pay Paul, you'll take from one of your domestic bills to find the money so that your child can go on the school trip. And of course, that's absolutely the right thing to do, but why not be ready for it this year a few months in advance by allocating money, and this is where your emergency fund really has its value. You're putting money aside. It's different from your savings account because you're saving in order to put money into investments or to cash that will earn interest on deposit in a bank or a building society account. Right now, you need to be able to pay for your child to go on a school trip. You need to be able to cover that completely known about $500, $1,500 bill that will come in for the car or a part of the house. Those large expenses are completely expected. What you cannot do is anticipate which month of the year they will fall or which particular aspect of your living expenses will be threatened or punished by that extra bill. If you've got the money aside, it's easy. You take it out of your emergency fund, you put it into your checking account or your core bank account and you make the payment. You sleep better at night, your stress levels are down, and you have the confidence of knowing that you have improved the way you're managing your money and your household budget. All seven of the bad money habits are overcome by knowing your numbers, by knowing that this is your monthly income, specific if you're in a, a job where you always get the same wage and there's no overtime or commission. And if there is overtime or commission, only ever run your budget on the basic salary. This is your expenses, this is your fixed income, and the gap here is either something that exists now, or if you're spending unconsciously, you need to work out what you need versus what you want, and you create that surplus through knowing your numbers. And if you're unsure of your numbers, work your numbers out and recalculate them every single week for the next three months or every month. Take the time to understand your numbers better to be conscious of your numbers, not be scared of learning about the numbers that affect you every day through your income and your cost of living. And as you gain more confidence with your spending and your budgeting habits, know your numbers inside out. Giving yourself just that extra little bit of knowledge will allow you to stay happy, stay frugal, and to stay thoughtful as you develop your positive money habits.